Bruce Lawn. Secrets of Hillsong addressed something that was extremely polarizing, sensitive, and in my opinion, needed a second video breakdown. If you didn't know, yesterday I talked about all the other stuff from Secrets of Hillsong. Specifically today, we are going to be talking about the idea of racism in the church. This is one of those topics that uh, upsets everybody. So I'm going to attempt to unpack this in the best way that I could. And here's the deal. I'm probably not going to get it right as a white dude. Okay? But I'm going to give you guys my thoughts because so many of you guys... Uh, hit me on the DM after watching the first breakdown of episodes one and two, and you wanted to know my my thoughts specifically on the race component. Now, it is no secret that Hillsong in New York City specifically, and that's what we're talking about, the docuseries from FX on Hulu, if you didn't know, anchored around Carl Lentz, episode two, he's all in it. And in it, they start talking about the institution, the greater institution dealing with with a misrepresentation that in terms of leadership, right? And having folks that are in these uh, predominantly black and brown progressive parts of the country, like New York City, and not always reflecting that. And the most egregious part in the documentary, which I think was also asinine, where they talked about them doing some sort of women's conference in Harlem, Harlem, and having an all-white woman's panel. Okay. That is utterly ridiculous. And I've seen this sort of stuff in church culture. I've seen uh, pastors say really racially insensitive things uh, with me in the room as if my, my wife isn't black and all my friends aren't black. And I've had to cor correct them and check them and, you know, say things. I've seen, uh, believe it or not, pastors, white pastors dress up in blackface and not see anything wrong with it and having to lean into that. So I've seen all kinds of bizarre, weirdo, cringe, insensitive behavior in the church. But I do think that there is a concern here that I want to get into that if you wait till the end of the video, I think is important for us to unpack. And again, this is one of those topics where if you are one side of the equation pointing out some of the things I'm going to point out, you are going to get dismissed as insensitive and, and or racist. And if you're presenting the other side, then the, you know, you're going to get dismissed as uh, liberal and woke and all these things. But I think there is a important balance here to strike. And so let's let's specifically address um, the accusations from the documentary. And I, I told you guys that I think in the documentary, there's a whole lot here that was backdooring other ideas. And it, it really came down to specifically the Harlem example, but more so Carl seemingly, Carl Lentz, seemingly being very progressive in his views on the sentiment that Black Lives Matter, while at the same time, there not being enough change in terms of what was visually represented in Hillsong's Sunday morning worship experience. They would have folks who are leading worship, have folks on stage, but not people in, I guess, real positions of leadership. And there was leaked recordings of Carl basically just saying, hey, I want it to be organic in a way that like the people who are qualified to be on stage that are great singers, uh, let's have them on and regardless on what their ethnic breakdown is. That was kind of his uh, take on it. And so there were some wild quotes about Hillsong. New York City, specifically things like they were trying to colonize the city, which is insane to me, the types of things. And so I understand how sensitive of a topic this conversation can be. And so what is my opinion on all this stuff? My opinion is quite simple. I think if a church is in a specific city, region, demographic, they should, and I think this is reasonable, make an attempt to reflect that demographic and reach that demographic. So if you're in a very multicultural, multi-ethnic part of the country like New York City, then hey, you know, try and reflect that. Try and make people feel welcome. Because sometimes what we do in church culture is we make everyone that comes to our into our community feel as if they have to assimilate 
to the pre-established church culture instead of saying, hey, how can we accommodate, right? It's assimilation to our genre of music, to how we do things, instead of saying, well, what is the demographics of the area that we're in, and can we do a better job of accommodating and reflecting that? And I think if we're talking about New York City, it is not unreasonable to say that the representation of the folks on stage should be similar to the makeup of the congregation. I think that is very reasonable. How you get there is going to be tough. But the reality is, assuming that most of these institutions are some sort of one extreme, fair meritocracy where the most talented people get the platform, I think it doesn't quite work that way because the people who end up planting the church aren't worker bees that grinded their way up to become the lead pastor. It's usually people that are connected. Call that cronyism, call that nepotism. Who do you think went and planted Hillsong New York? Brian Houston's son, okay? Carl Lentz was his best friend. That's how a lot of these things start. You work with people that you enjoy, and so the demand for there to be um, a person of color as a lead pastor or someone of that, is that reasonable when the entire institution is this way? Now, here is something that was left out, and then I'm gonna give you guys the cautionary aspect of this. Something that was left out with this specific conversation in terms of Hillsong never promoting uh, people to reflect the community is that Hillsong actually did this after the time of Carl Lentz falling. What am I talking about? If you didn't know, Hillsong Atlanta had a black lead pastor. They had an apologist, uh, apologetics pastor that was black. They had a predominantly black staff in Hillsong, Atlanta. So again, does this documentary have an ax to grind in making this a massive institutional problem to kind of make the entire church at large seem as if they're just flippant and racist? Or was there something going on in these attempts to change? Because Carl was seemingly very transparent that he was attempting to change things. He was attempting and he was doing his best to change things. Hillsong Atlanta was the institutional reflection of that said change. And of course, some of you guys may not know, but after the Brian Houston allegations came out, which I'm sure they're going to discuss in episode three and four, Hillsong Atlanta pulled away from the broader Hillsong uh, brand and became an independent autonomous church. So do you guys think that that's okay for the documentary to say they never have people in these types of positions of leadership and it's messed up and everybody is white and all the white males are running everything? And yet there was black lead pastors, black apologist pastors at their latest plant in Hillsong, Atlanta, after the fact. I don't know. That's something to think about. Now, here is the flip side to everything I just said. The flip side to all of this, and this is what, what, what we trigger some of you, is that what we saw after 2016 and the disgusting things we saw in terms of folks being mistreated by police officers, many of them losing their lives, specifically black folks, and in 2020, obviously with the George Floyd thing, is we saw the organization that was supposed to represent a re very reasonable sentiment, by the way. Black Lives Matter. The sentiment is very reasonable. But the organization that represented said sentiment backdoored all kinds of bizarre things. And in our desire to want to see more equality of opportunity, is our mind and our frame of view being warped by other things that are getting backdoored? Okay? And I'm going to be very specific and... and this, this may offend some of you, okay? What am I talking about? Specifically, what Black Lives Matter, the organization, not the sentiment. I want to make sure I make a clear distinction. Black Lives Matter, the organization, specifically in their own bylaws, pushed for trans rights. They pushed for uh, the disruption of the nuclear family, the mom and dad in the same home, right? They wanted to disrupt that. And then when they got called out on it, all that stuff came down. It's interesting, isn't it? Right? The same organization in many ways, mismanaged and squandered a lot of money, bought multiple million-dollar rental properties, right? So not only was there an idealistic agenda that was in contrary with the gospel, supporting LGTV, supporting Transformers, 
disrupting the nuclear family. That's it. That's in, that's in direct opposition to the gospel. There was also a mismanagement of funds. Now, let me be even more specific. What kind of st- what kind of stuff could be being backdoored in the ideology, not in the people, but in the ideology? Okay, this is one of the leaders in some of these conversations. And this headline reads: Can we really cure racist discrimination by anti-racist discrimination? And when you look at the actual ideologies being driven. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. This is Imbram Kennedy's 2019 How to Be Anti-Racist, page 19. Okay? So in order to correct past discriminations or present discriminations, we have to do future discriminations. That doesn't sound like the gospel to me, friends. And is some of this stuff being slid in to this type of thinking, right? Is some of this stuff in a desire for equality and a desire for equal opportunity is equity being split in, which is equal outcomes of all groups, right? I should not get paid what LeBron James gets paid to play basketball. Why? Because I'm not as good as LeBron James. So there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equity, okay? I think most people say, yeah, reflect the demographics of the community you're in. Duh, if you're gonna do a women's conference in Harlem, consider your freaking audience, duh. But when we start getting into we need a, a perfect breakdown of every single ethnicity, of all these different things, uh, well, is that how it's going to work? Especially when Hillsong, which I have a lot of critique with, then did that by planting Hillsong Atlanta with all black leadership. Okay. Let me give you another example of of how this stuff plays out. Uh, And you're going to see more and more of this. And I just want people to know that, hey, be intentional of the things you're thinking about these things. And if, and if things are getting backdoored that you actually aren't for, and what is the upstream of some of these ideologies that are being presented. I understand how sensitive of a topic this is, and I understand that people feel legitimate hurt. The flip side is there are people that will go out and exploit your legitimate hurt and backdoor ideologies that you actually want nothing to do with. Okay, here's an example. This is breaking points. This is not Fox News. This is not Newsmax. This is not Daily Wire. This is breaking points. Breaking points does independent me, uh, new, me, news and media. This is Sagar on the left, Crystal Ball on the right. They're not Christians, okay? But they're addressing something that the New York Times recently admitted uh, about some of the stuff that we're seeing downstream from the D'Angelo's and the Kimdies, okay? And this does, best believe it, this does affect folks in the church. The New York Times wrote this incredible nonsense story about, quote, why some companies are saying diversity and belonging instead of diversity and inclusion. He says, incredible stuff. Businesses are finding out that DEI consultants they hire are running programs. Now, if you don't know what DEI is, there's a huge movement right now in corporate America, okay? And this is already imploding on its head. Programs that create even more identity-based hostility and are responding by hiring other DEI consultants who market themselves as not doing that. As he says, quote, all of this is fake. Now, the reason why this is hilarious is that you basically have the new religion of DEI inside of every Fortune 500 company in America and have now basically for the last couple of years, especially ramping up after the George Floyd protests. People thought that they were doing the right thing and said, oh, we're going to eliminate racism by hiring DEI consultants. However, all evidence that we currently have, Crystal, all evidence, as evidenced by this New York Times article, is that saying, to quote, diversity and inclusion, and emphasizing the place of race, quote unquote, implicit bias, quote unquote, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote, like microaggressions or macroaggressions in some cases, are actually increasing hostility in the workplace, racist thoughts, and are having the opposite intended effect. Now, and also, Do any of these people work? I have no idea why aerospace engineers are subjected to raise your hand whenever you had a racist thought literally at work. Sounds like something you should do on your own time. In their attempt for diversity and inclusion, they're actually making the issue worse. In an attempt of Lentz saying, hey, this is an issue. He's going to be a quote unquote progressive voice on this. He what? He made these things worse. He was viewed as less empathetic. He was viewed as, right, uh, 
Hillsong was trying to colonize New York City. True quote from the documentary series. So in, in an attempt to do this, there's actually people who, whether it's their ideology or whether it's flat out exploitation or backdoing things like this Kemdi quote that I just read to you guys, right? Only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That is not kingdom. It's not Christian. And this is the conversation that's hard to have with regards to this. I mean, some of these ladies who are out there making multi, Ibrahim Kendi making Ibrahim Kendi, yeah, I just mentioned him. Millions of dollars charging uh, these places to give them lectures and to teach their babies anti-racism and all this stuff. And instead, it's actually making people not only more racist, actually no evidence. A, it's not changing anything on racism, so congratulations. And B, like, they are basically just bilking Fortune 500 companies to check a box when they can go to Wall Street and say, see, we have all of our employees that are going undergoing diversity and inclusion. And meanwhile, you have employees, I can't tell you the amount of people I know who are subjected to these things, who it in Ages them to their core. A, they're being uh, taken away from whatever they're supposed to be doing, and B, they're like, I don't, they're like, I don't even agree with this, and you're basically shoving this down my throat, and you're making me angrier about this problem, which I didn't even think was a problem in the first place. The research has long been in that if you actually care about um, combating racism, which I do, this diversity and inclusion consultant grift complex yeah. is fake. Right. It doesn't work. If anything, it makes things worse, according to a bunch of you know uh, data that they have in the New York Times. And this is going to be my and, and forgive me for being. Um, extremely simple in this solution, but I think this solution is relationship. I think the solution is all of us being willing to press into friendship and relationship and community with people that are different than us. White folks wanting to learn about black folks, black folks wanting to learn about white folks, Hispanics, everybody. I think when there's relationship, we should be we should be leading to a place of charity and believing the best about each other, especially if we're followers of Jesus. We should be saying, I'm not going to assume that just by the color of your skin, you're racist by default. I'm not going to assume that just because you are proud of your black ethnicity that you don't like white people. I'm not going to do that. We're, we're, we're going to build relationship and we're going to believe the best about each other. And we're going to be curious about the differences that make us up. We're not going to say that we're colorblind because we're not, but we're going to embrace all the amazing, unique ways that God has made us. And if we have that, the logical conclusion of that, friends, naturally, because we're born again and we have the Spirit of God, is we will see healthy representation that reflects the tribes and the audiences and the communities that we're in front of. If I'm actually caring for my audience here, and my audience here loves what we're talking about, and my audience here incorporates folks who are women and are black women. It is not unreasonable for me to listen to them and say, well, by golly, maybe I should have more black women on sometimes. Maybe I can learn something. That's not a diversity quota. That's not affirmative action. That's just being a normal human being that, that builds relationships and listens to people. Saying, hey, if we attract diverse audiences, which is a, a massive W in my opinion, because we are in a very pluralistic society, well, then the byproduct that you be, well, let me listen to my audience. And, and everybody wins, in my opinion. Right? So I, I don't think this is that complicated. I think some of this stuff from Kim D and D'Angelo is straight poison. I think the upstream of the, the upstream where this stuff came from is way darker than we want representation and equal opportunity. I think that's influenced a lot of people. Oftentimes, white liberals that are trying to overcompensate for the white guilt they feel, and so they're going to be more anti-racist than black people, which is freaking weird, right? 
And so we have folks that are manipulating these things, stirring the pot, and now legitimate issues that Hillsong had, and Carl Lentz had, and Brian Houston had, which I'm sure the series is going to explore, is being conflated with, well, they're not uh, as affirming as LGTV as I want them to be. Right? And so there's a lot of stuff that gets backdoored attached to a radical leftist ideology that has nothing to do with the real issues of how this entire thing hit, hit, hit the fan. And that's a bummer. I don't think that we need to just have representation for the sake of representation. I think we should have representation out of an overflow and an abundance of relationship. Just like I don't think you should force people to give to charity. I think people should give to charity because they love other people and want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Right? And again, I, I, I don't think these things are that complicated. And I also think that we need to not be so quick to dismiss and discard people that are different, everyone included. I think we also need to not be so quick to label people that we think are different. Oh, well, that's patriarchy and that's white supremacy. I saw an article today that said punctuality is white supremacy. And here's the flip side. Oh, Ruslan's talking about racism. He's woke. He's a liberal. He's a leftist. That's another L. Stop trying to dismiss people and label them as something instead of actually engaging with the differences. You can't just blanket patriarchy everything. You can't just blame white supremacy for everything. You can't just say everything is woke and everything is CRT. These are complicated issues that require people to listen to each other and figure these things out. And for me, this has always been the, the, the tension of my life because I was a, a white kid raised in a predominantly black neighborhood into hip hop. Most of my closest friends are black. My wife is black. My family's black, right? So this has always been a tension that I've lived in. But I think all of it can easily slide into being divisive from both sides. From the conservative side of everything is woke and CRT and just dismiss people as liberals and crazies to the you know identity po uh, politics, everything is white supremacy and patriarchy. I don't think either side is helpful. Some of this stuff is 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 Kim D. Some of this stuff is D'Angelo. Some of this stuff is Marxism. Some of this stuff is we want to overthrow the system completely, not reform the system. Those of us that are Protestants, remember, Martin Luther didn't come to start a new church. Martin Luther came to reform the church. There are issues in our society that need to be reformed, not torn away, burnt to the ground, and rebuilt, okay? Reformation. That is a good thing. There are issues, things that need to be done, we need to do better at, right? So anyway, uh, two things. If you're anywhere near Las Vegas, join me in What Do You Mean at the Christian Influencers Convention, July 26th. I would love to get to know you. I'd love to hang out with you. Here's a little information about that. And of course, as always, Instead of partnering with us in our online community. Here you go. Las Vegas, join me and some of you guys might be familiar with my boy Ruslan KD. Las Vegas, join me for the Christian Influencers Convention happening July 26th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. We'll be doing a panel with some of the top influencers in the country, as well as a private, intimate meet and greet. You can get tickets and more information by hitting the Eventbrite link below. Don't miss this opportunity to come and hang out and spend some time with some of your favorite Christian influencers. All in the beautiful city of Las Vegas. July 26th, I'll see you over there. Peace. I'll see you there. What do you mean? Our friends at GenuCell Skincare have exciting news to celebrate in 2023. Using Manscaped during my showers after workout has given me much more confidence. And that's where mud water comes in. True Classic has got your back. All thanks to the sponsor of today's video, SayMine.com. Established Titles is your opportunity to earn the title of Laird. 
lady. Subject credit approval rates range from 7.99% APR to 19.99% APR, included 0.50% auto pay discount. If you don't want us to make ads with brands you don't care about, sign up for our online community for as little as $5 a month to keep us independent and ultimately answering to you as our boss. You get all sorts of benefits like daily replays of our after party streams, exclusive access to our Discord community, and early access to our podcast interviews, all starting for only $5 a month. King Stream Entertainment, Bruce Long.